glowing blue stones, world's greatest breath freshener, or deadly radioactive material. I'm Kevin Leeson. Mary Curie's banana bread recipe. Worth the risk? I'm Joe Fulgham. How many Z's in tungsten? More than you think. I'm Torn Atkinson. These questions and more answered on tonight's Caustic Soda, the podcast. Welcome to Caustic Soda, everybody. Caustic Soda, the podcast where we take disgusting and yet interesting and horrific and sometimes tragic topics and break them down. Deconstruction, if you will. Yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, topic for, t- for this week. Radiation. Radiation. And our pinup. What happened to my pinup? I lost it It's already. on the other side. I saw it. Other side. Marie Curie. Oh. No, that's a drawing I did of a scorpion. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Is that, a that could be Marie Curie after the radiation's dealt with her. Well, there she is. Look at her. Uh, a handsome oh, woman. Handsome, handsome with woman. With radioactive hair, clearly. <laughs> Joining us today, we have a guest. Our first guest uh, ever in Caustic Soda history. Uh, Joe, you seem to be most familiar with our guest. Why yeah, you Joining us is a good old friend of mine, uh, Dr. Rob Tarswell, a nuclear physician. Well, actually, Rob, why don't I uh, let you introduce yourself and, and what you've done, because, boy, you know a lot more about it than I do. Well, currently, I'm uh, one year away from completing uh, residency training in nuclear medicine at uh, UBC. And then before that, uh, maybe we can go back into some of your, I mean, if you like, you, sure. you have a, I, Rob has a storied past and I, and did I you ever play Gamma to. World? I didn't play Gamma World. Oh, oh. well, wow. welcome to That's episode weird. three of Caustic Soda. <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, I guess maybe we need to go around and reintroduce ourselves as well. I'm Kevin Leeson. I'm Joe Fulgham. I'm Torn Atkinson. So radiation, it hurts. It burns. But it's, it's useful. Useful. Oh, it's a double headed sword. The <laughs> double the double edged sword, the, the double headed sword. Beware the double headed sword of science. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about how radiation works, Rob? Well, the basic idea is that uh, radiation is, uh, there, there's two types essentially. There's electromagnetic radiation, which energy of which is proportional to the, the frequency. Um, so the and what does that mean, proportional to the frequency? <laughs> what? Well, uh, <laughs> No, carry on. <laughs> how, don't answer. How deeply do we need which, to delve which, into Which of the words did you not understand? What does it mean, science? <laughs> now, what? now explain science. Just, <laughs> or another way of putting it is uh, there's two forms of radiation, photonic emissions, um, some of which are coming from the light bulb right now and are allowing us to see, and particulate emissions. Do you mean we're being irradiated by that light right now? As we sit here. But that's No, that's electromagnetic. That's electromagnetic. Okay. Those are not particulate emissions. So those but are... isn't X-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Yes, and gamma rays, and uh, there are uh, cosmic background rays that are penetrating the room and going through us, and uh, neutrinos. I feel getting angrier every so second. So is, kind of is this kind of a scale then? Uh, like, does it go from, from this is more wavy and this is more particle and... They go back and forth because I know of the, I know about, I know of the term wavicle, but I don't really know anything about it. You just made I, it I think a wavicle is that thing that you have in the summer to make yourself feel cooler. It sounds like that's, a, that's, I think that's a popsicle. It sounds like a Snapple flavor. <laughs> wavicle. wavicle. Wavicle green. Oh, I broke my wavicle the other day. <laughs> to, to answer the question, uh, <laughs> from a human health point of view, uh, it doesn't matter. And so we consider a very sort of simplified model of uh, radiation, but it works perfectly fine in terms of uh, what we do day to day for radiology, nuclear medicine, or radiotherapy. Wow. I do prefer the simplified model. <clears throat> yeah. Well, so at what point in time did people figure out that that radiation uh, was deadly? Well, that How I- long been handling radioactive material before people went, ouch? Yeah, very good, very good question. Uh, do we have to go back to Marie Curie? Further back, Henri Becquerel was the discoverer of radiation, and he discovered it quite by accident from having uh, samples on photographic plates that left images when developed. Mm. And he said there must be something emanating from these rocks that's how, causing this to happen. Uh, Dr. Rob, how, maybe you can explain to me, how come everything in science seems to be discovered by accident? That I don't know, but I, uh, I sure hope it keeps happening. Well, I, I, think, I think if you, if you go there, if you know it's there, then it's already discovered. So, oh, yeah, hey, otherwise look. it wouldn't be called a discovery. Right. Oh, well, called, but uh, when they went sailing for the new world, they knew that they were going to find something. Uh, okay. Actually, no. 
uh, they were trying to find a passage to the uh, to the Indies, to the West Indies. Okay, well, that's and then, completely and then, oh, what, what's this whole new continent right now? Sorry, that, that's completely they, off. They but then they suffered horrible radiation burns. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Dr. Rob. Please continue. Um, we were talking about accidental discoveries. Uh, radiation. Uh, Henry Becquerel. Oh, Becquerel. Was just, just, was he was just being a good scientist. He was taking photographs of these samples and just as a proper control said, well, I'd better just put these samples on a photographic plate in the dark and then develop those to see what happens. And by God, there were images of the rocks in black and white on the, the, uh, on the plates. And he said, there must be something coming from these rocks. And that was uh, radiation. Now, we didn't discover that radiation was a problem, actually, until several decades later when uh, radium was discovered could phosphoresce, and then they made uh, glow-in-the-dark watches for uh, soldiers in World War I. Oh, sweet. I want to get one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, painting required very fine-tipped brushes, and so uh, the women who painted in the factories would... Oh, uh, no. Yes, put the tip the brush in their to mouth to get the sharp. nice fine point, yeah. right? And then a lot of them started developing uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, um, meaning that the, the, the bone in the jaw was dying. They started developing cancers of the head and neck. Yeah, I think I've heard of this. And so finally, people put it together. Oh, my God, radiation is a human health hazard. Radiation wow. is evil! And, the, and now, now, how far in advance of Marie Curie was that? That happened after Marie Curie died. Uh, she insisted her entire life that radiation was perfectly safe and would carry and that's samples. Why she kept of, in her pocket. She would keep samples of polonium, <laughs> which she discovered, and radium in her pocket. And to this day, her her lab in France is so radioactive that uh, uh, people can't enter it. And it will be that way for hundreds, if not thousands, of years because she studied very long lived isotopes. Did well, she do all her work in a shed or something? Uh, I don't know the particulars, actually. She probably worked in a, uh, a number of different places. Well, but uh, I, I know for a fact that Marie Curie, I remember just reading about Marie Curie's life and then being surprised at how long she lived. I mean, she lived into her 60s, didn't she? Right, 66, I believe. But the disease she died of, aplastic anemia, or complete failure of your body to produce any blood cell lines, is a very rare disorder outside of uh, radioactive damage to bone marrow. And outside of the House TV show. And uh, every second episode of House. <laughs> right. Well, they mention it. Well, it's so how do you explain her living to 66 years old carrying around radioactive material in her pocket for like, like well, well on to 40 years? Fantastic. Well, this gets us into there, there are essentially two human health effects from radiation. And the first effect is what we call deterministic effects, meaning if you get this much radiation, this will happen to you. And those would be the syndromes that everybody knows about, like, you know, mm. bleeding out your mouth and anus, uh, losing your mm. hair, brain death. That's my least favorite kind of bleeding. <laughs> and then there are what we call stochastic effects or random effects of radiation, which may or may not occur to you. Mm. And it's not clear what the minimum dose needed to acquire that is. We just know that more is worse, and she probably just simply suffered a stochastic effect of radiation exposure, essentially developing a kind of, uh, a kind of cancer. I wow. see that her laboratory is preserved at the Musée Curie, and due to their levels of radioactivity, her papers from the, uh, from the 1890s are considered too dangerous to handle, and even her cookbook it's highly radioactive. Wow. Highly radioactive. I think they should publish, publish the radioactive cookbook of Marie Curie. Yeah, absolutely. And they're kept in lead-lined boxes, and those who wish to consult them <laughs> must wear protective clothing. <laughs> must be really good like, recipes. That is, i got to tell you, I mean, I'm no, I'm no nuclear scientist, or, or, or uh, I'm certainly not a scholar, and I don't have any reason to consult Marie Curie's papers, but were I needing to, I would probably think twice about consulting those papers. She missed a good atomic croissant. That's right. i got to tell you, her banana bread is to die for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what I mean? I, you'd think you could get that information elsewhere. Like, somebody probably made a copy. I could probably consult a copy. That's I don't right. need to go to the original <laughs> paper and get my eyes burned out of my head. But, but you could, like, tell everybody, uh, oh, this banana bread is great. Where did you get the recipe? Well, let me tell you. I don't. I, had to put on I donned a lead line suit. A hazmat suit. <laughs> lead lining. And I actually went, oh, to a, be... I went to a website where uh, they uh, they make these not hazmat suits, but hazmat suits that are also radio radioactive protection and stuff like that. They look pretty spacey, and they also make like this kind of like shield that you can just hold up. A radioactive shield. Yeah. Or, or radioactive proof shield. Yeah. yeah. Ah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
A radio hydro shield would be counterproductive. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I have a hunch that any shield you could actually lift wouldn't stop very much radiation. Really? Well, couldn't you just tuck in behind okay, it well, really that, tightly? Okay, well, that actually uh, begs the question then. Uh, what, how much material, what type of material do you need to kind of protect yourself from... Well, I guess it depends on how well, much radiation we're talking there's about. There's three kinds of radiation, isn't there? Alpha, beta, and gamma. Sure, for simple purposes, you can, or well, really, for simple, very simple purposes. Remember you can, how I like for the simplified model? Yeah, break radiation <laughs> down into, again, photon emissions, so X rays, gamma rays, or uh, particulate emissions, which would be things like, yeah, alphas, uh, betas, neutrons, uh, protons, positrons. And the uh, stopping uh, power of any particular material is a function of the uh, particle that's coming in. So um, in terms of, again, you know, I'm always thinking in terms of reference to human health, alpha particles, if uh, ingested, are incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how the Russians killed uh, Litvinenko in, um, in Britain about oh, 10 yeah. or 15 well, years ago. Assassination this. by radioactivity. I oh, remember the, this one. Yeah, yeah the Litvinenko uh, They, they case. slipped it in his drink or they something. They slipped it into his tea yeah. at a sushi place. Yeah, and he got on a plane and like started to feel the effects or something and then died. He ended up dying thing. in hospital and there was a big hunt for, well, what killed this man? And they were thinking toxins and toxins, toxins, toxins. Well, nothing was coming up. Nothing was coming up. And finally, on a, somebody said, well, let's test his urine for radiation and, and bingo. And alpha radiation is very difficult to detect. It, wasn't, it was internally. barium or something, wasn't it, that they did him with? It was polonium. Polonium. Oh, yeah. polonium, of course, of course. Oh, right. wouldn't it be awesome if they did it to him in Poland? <laughs> they slipped him polonium in Poland? Oh, I think uh, I just... I and he was riding a pony? <laughs> a prancing <clears throat> pony? And they put it Never in mind. his pocket? Please, tell us more about Libby. <laughs> I'm glad I got This is, this is uh, James taking radioactivity to the James Bond level. Oh, it's it. fantastic. Yeah. I mean, the reason Litvinenko was of interest, he was a former KGB agent who... Uh, he was writing a book or something. He wrote it? a book about how the um, supposed the detonation of apartment blocks in Moscow, which was meant to foment popular sympathy against the Chechen uprising, he alleged and actually had very good evidence that this was a KGB operation, even though there was no more KGB. I mean, it's still all the same guys. Putin was the former head of the KGB. It just doesn't have that name anymore. I'm sure they even have the same office building. They just paper over the old logo. Well, some of his former colleagues came to have a little chat with him about this, and not too many weeks later, he was dead. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, did, did, did he glow blue like Dr. Manhattan? He did not glow blue like uh, Dr. Manhattan. There no. probably wasn't a significant enough amount of uh, radiation to get a Sharonkov effect. You know who did glow blue, though? Tell me. Was, Tell me, Joe. Was uh, Louis Sloten. Louis, Louis Sloten. Sloten? Louis Sloten was a Canadian physicist, uh, and he worked at the uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. And, That's uh, not a Canada. Uh, it's not, as a matter of fact. Apparently, uh, in order to get good uh, phys physicist jobs, you have to go down to the States, especially if you want to play with uh, critical masses of radioactive material, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which he was doing. Uh, when was this? This was uh, 1946, and uh, so so well after uh, World War II, or a year or so after World War II ended. But uh, he was uh, showing off to a few other scientists uh, uh, some beryllium half spheres. <laughs> the way that you do. Which I think is, I, I think it's awesome because the beryllium sphere powers the ship in uh, Galaxy Quest. That's right. I love that. And apparently they were around a plutonium core, and this was a critical mass, and they normally kept these shims to keep them separate, because if you keep the distance, then you don't get the, the critical mass reaction, or critical the criticality event, I guess is what it's called. But he had removed the shims and was just keeping them apart with a screwdriver. So just joshing was around. It? Just joshing around I, with I the don't, gang. Just juggling it, What I found spares. hasn't shown if he was like, hey guys, check this out, but it really yeah. seems that way, cause, cause cause he he because is, apparently... He was using a screwdriver <laughs> instead of... The, the screwdriver was not at all part of the experimental protocol. It shouldn't have been there. They should have, you know... I'm pretty uh, sure that wasn't but in there the... Were, uh, uh, didn't get it from a time lord. There were seven other scientists <laughs> watching him do this, so I don't know if he was... No, if it was a dare or whatever. Or do you know even worse? And they're all like laughing, like, hey, check out Sloan, he's so anyway, such then what a happened? getter. Well, what happened is uh, the screwdriver slipped, and the upper beryllium hemisphere fell, and uh, it caused uh, what they call a prompt critical reaction and a burst of hard radiation. Uh, and the other scientists in the room, in fact, observed a blue glow of air ionization and felt a heat wave. He felt a were, were the rest of the scientists like behind glass or something? They were all uh, around him, but they were all at, uh, at different, varying uh, distances from this event. But he was standing like right on it, yeah. like his body was right over it. Uh, the he next probably closest guy was shielded only about three the rest feet away. Of, he probably shielded the rest of the I, scientists. Rob would have to tell us. I really don't think so. I think uh, I'm 
guessing it's just that uh, because he was so close, and it's probably so, would it be some kind of distance, uh, like a uh, yeah, distance squared? Radiation kind of? decreases on the inverse square law. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So with the inverse square law, the further you are away, the much much less radiation you get. So let me so guess how so this. Much let me guess how this story ends. He, oh yeah. He, he got superpowers. Yeah. And saved planet Earth from invasion by That's an alien right. force. He, he stopped reacting with time and saw everything at the same time, mm -hmm. knew what was going to happen. And he wrote a paper about it. And uh, Yeah. I'm no, sure uh, actually what happened was uh, he uh, got exposed to a lethal dose of radiation uh, Ooh. instantly. Go ran, he ran outside and threw up, which uh, apparently is happens all the time when you get a lot of radiation. And they rushed into the hospital, but uh, quickly realized that there was nothing that could be done. They tried to give him blood transfusions. And uh, none of that helped, and he died nine days later. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a sec. I know this story. This is uh, John Cusack from Fat Man and Little Boy. It is, actually. But in that oh, hold movie, on a second. Yeah. Hold on a second. Exactly. Fat Man and Little Boy, the movie, right. was about the building of the atomic bombs, exactly. codenamed Fat Man and Little Boy, the two atomic bombs they dropped on Japan. Yes. This story took place after World War II. That's right. But... Fat Man and Little Boy took place before the end of World War II because right. they had not yet. Are you saying the they took liberties? They did in a Hollywood film. They actually created a, a, a fictional character who was a composite of Sloten uh, and another character uh, whose name I don't have. So anyway. John Cusack never existed. In John Cusack. <laughs> That's right. Tell tell the John makers Cusack of Hot Tub exists. Time Machine. John Cusack exists all the way through time, <clears throat> which is why he knows how to pick uh, very clever movies to play in. Mm. Because he's seen the future. So, uh, yeah, Sloten died nine days later, and they knew it was going to happen, and uh, apparently everybody was very upset. They had to keep it quiet, and they had to keep working on this project, uh, knowing that their friend was dying in the oh. hospital of radiation poisoning. There was just nothing to be done. So he, everybody knew the clock was ticking, and it wasn't going to be too long down the road before they couldn't he couldn't say anything about it. Did he get one of those make-a-wish trips to Disneyland, at the very least? <laughs> oh, did they not exist? I think that's for kids. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they have named an asteroid after him, actually. Really? 1995, the uh, 12423 Sloten was named in his honor. In the, the, wait, 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 hold on. It, it was discovered in 95. It was named after him in 2000. It wasn't just the Sloten, though. It was the 12 what? The 12343 Sloten? 12423 uh, Sloten. I mean, come on. If you're going to name an asteroid, you got it. He's like the 12,000th Sloten to get an asteroid named after him? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know many, of many Slotens. Uh, I think it's just the way that, uh, that they name asteroids. Uh, they put them. Well. They put the number on there as well. You'd think the Sloten could actually get top billing. Maybe it could be the Sloten 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? Mm. That would be pretty cool. So let's talk about Cherenkov radiation, as right. Egon pronounces it in the episode of the real Ghostbusters. Uh, I don't remember which one. Right, so uh, <laughs> typically it's a, it's a known law of relativity that nothing can exceed the speed of light, but uh, it, there, there's, there's exceptions to that. Nothing can exceed the speed of light in a vacuum, but in liquid or solid media, uh, radiation can, under certain circumstances, temporarily exceed the speed of light. And very much like a sonic wave, you get a radiation shock wave, which the result of is the blue glow. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Which would be why the poor old, Manhattan effect, as I like to call it. Poor old Sloten blowed, blowed blue. That is, wow. Yeah, I'm looking he's, at the so pictures. So he's, he's sort of a new age blue boy. And this is, this is such a really cool looking a blue, blue boy too. for the radioactive era. Okay, so do, do we know why that is? Why is it that it can travel faster through a medium? Like, does the medium give it a push? Uh, that's a question I would defer to a physicist. Right. <laughs> uh, that's not me. Well, this, this is a radiation suit. Radiation suit? Of course. Because of all the fallout from the atomic wars. Now, what's interesting is in terms of the most uh, powerful uh, human health hazard, the alpha particle, externally, it's stopped by a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. or even just skin. So um, as long as it you don't get it ingested, inside you, yeah, yeah it's got to be ingested to be a hazard. The next level would be something like the, the beta particle, which is essentially a high-speed electron, which you actually want to stop with uh, low density or a low Z material or something with a low atomic number. By the way, they say a low Z material? A low Z material. What's an example of a low Z material? Well, that would be something like paraffin, plastic, as opposed oh. to sort of the traditional sort of lead that you think about. And what does the Z stand for? That's for the atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus. Oh. Because if you take high-speed electrons and try to stop them directly with lead, which might be the sort of the common sense approach, what ends up happening... That's what Superman would do. That's what Superman <laughs> might do, and he would kill us all. Because the electrons would emit, or would cause Bremsstrahlung radiation to be emitted <laughs> so from the tight Bremsstrahlung. It's German for breaking radiation. Oh, okay. Because as the beta particles come in close to the uh, nucleus of a high-density material, the electrostatic interaction pulls the uh, particle out of its uh, straight-line path, 
and the change in momentum causes the emission of uh, gamma. So what you want is to stop the electrons in a low Z material oh, and wow. then use lead on the outside to stop the uh, mm. low-level bremsstrahlung. Because there's, there's two different kinds of particles? Because of the law of conservation of energy, if you're going to change the momentum of a radioactive particle, that itself causes the release of gamma radiation. Oh. Right. <laughs> was, that a, was that an O oh, because you're and impressed or O oh, because you don't know what that means? <laughs> <laughs> I just started thinking about the Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess let's, let's solve the comic do- book debate right now, Dr. Rob. Gamma rays, deadly or superpower? And will, will, it, will it turn your skin green or gray? The ultimate debate. Or red. The Hulk is now red. Well, I, there, hey, I'm a, a, I'm a red Hulk. That's I'm not the same a, one. Oh, it's not the same one. No. I'm a traditionalist. Okay, well, we'll gray see or green, sir? <laughs> gray or green? I guess that depends uh, how long you wait afterwards. If you get to the gangrenous stage, or if it yeah. just goes to sort of dry, <laughs> gangrene, and dead skin. All right, so starting gray, good answer. turning to green. So how do you? So that solves the beta. I've got beta radiation coming at me now. I know right. how to defend myself. What about gamma rays? Gamma rays, you just pretty much want to stop with lots of lead, depending on the energy of the uh, gamma photons themselves. Okay, so going back to we were, you were saying uh, any shield you could hold up probably wouldn't be enough. Unless you're shielding from a beta emitter. Right, then you could hold up like a candle shield. Sure, right, something made of paraffin. <laughs> a big candle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get a paraffin suit. <laughs> I'm going to hide behind a candle. That's, I never would have thought that, that that's, would actually that's, do hide a job. behind a candle. That's, that's Captain America's newest shield. It's made of paraffin. paraffin. Also a good way to stop neutrons, paraffin blocks. That's, how, that's what they use in uh, mm. reactors or graphite. So, again, low wow. Z materials. So, carbon. Just, so just a, a, a mechanical pencil in your pocket will do it. <laughs> Absolutely. For, the, yeah. for that one <laughs> tiny yeah. strip for of the, the pen, the neutron. As, as long as it's... Just the neutrons that hit the pencil. Marie Curie. Could have somebody, used that somebody right shoot you, her and her exactly. piece of, somebody uh, shoot you with thing. a beta particle gun, some evil supervillain. Like, oh, and my just, lucky pencil yeah, that's right, saved me. Saved by your lucky pencil. Exactly. Nice, just nice. like the uh, the Holy Bible in your pocket. Or the bullet, or the exactly. flask. That's right, or the flask. Jacket pocket. They the said drinking TV. was going to kill me. Uh, I'd like to talk about radiophobia. Ra- okay. Radiophobia and uh, the Castle Bravo uh, was the code name for a test in uh, the Bikini Atoll. Uh, in uh, Japan, where they were doing the tests, I guess, in 1954, well after the war. Now, radiophobia, abnormal fear of ionizing radiation, also used in the sense of fear of x-rays. But Castle Bravo is uh, particularly apt for this phobia because the Castle Bravo test (laughs) caught the Japanese fishing boat Daigo Fukuryu Maru in its radioactive plume. Even though it was fishing outside the predicted fallout area, all of the crew fell sick, and the the boat's uh, radio man died less than seven months later. It was later estimated that about 100 fishing boats were contaminated to to some degree by fallout from the test. We'll talk about fallout, the video game, a little later. Oh boy. <laughs> and so the incident created widespread fear of uncontrolled and unpredictable nuclear weapons and also radioactivity, uh, can fish fish uh, in, Jap- in the Japanese food supply. And with the publication of Sir Joseph Rotblatt. Well, that's a science name if yeah, I've ever heard one. Yeah, Sir Rotblatt. <laughs> Finding the contamination caused the fallout from the Castle Bravo test was nearly 1,000 <laughs> times greater than that stated officially. Outcry in Japan, of course, reached a, uh, a level that uh, the incident was dubbed by some as a second Hiroshima. Now, here's the interesting thing, how it gets into pop culture. Because the Castle Bravo test and the new fears of radioactive <clears throat> fallout uh, inspired a new direction in art and cinema, the Godzilla films, beginning with uh, the landmark 1954 film, Gojira. Uh, are strong metaphors for post-war are you sure, radiophobia. Are you sure you're pronouncing all these Japanese things correctly? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm you 100%. speak Japanese? Uh, domo arigato, mis- no. <laughs> I, I speak a little Japanese. Mushi mushi. Oh, mushi mushi. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's kind of how radiophobia got started, I would say. Because uh, somebody bombed the heck out of a bunch of fishermen. Yeah, yeah, in, in just a test. And uh, Akira Kurosawa had that uh, 1955 film, I Live in Fear. Oh, right. Which so this about, seems uh, to be a, unreasoning terror of radiation and nuclear war. This seems to be a, a particularly Japanese phenomenon, is what you're saying. But that, I mean, that makes perfect sense. But with them having been the only country in the world to actually have a bomb dropped, yeah, on to them. have the exact. So I, I think uh, entirely it's reasonable. Fair. It's entirely fair. Entirely reasonable yeah. expectation. And it led to some great monster films. 
I, yeah, I would hope that if something horrible like that happens to me, that I can at least create an amazing new form of cinema. With exactly. Giant rubber monsters. I mean, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna do something, create monster cinema out of it. If the end result of something horrible happening is fantastic monster cinema, I think then we can you're all, all for it. <laughs> then I think we can all agree. I think we can all agree that the payoff. Every may... every radioactive cloud has its silver lining. <laughs> When the swallows come back to Capistrano, that's the day you promised to come back to me. When you whispered farewell in Capistrano, Was the day the swallows flew out to the sea? All the mission bells will ring, the chapel choir will sing, the happiness you'll bring will live in my memory. When the swallows come back to Capistrano, that's the day I pray that you'll come back to me. Soda. I'm hey. Torin. I'm Joe. So I guess now it's uh, radiation in the news. Radiation in the news and in pop culture. Yeah, absolutely. Our uh, special guest, Dr. Rob, is here. You do prefer to be called Dr. Rob, don't you? <laughs> That's fine. Or if you're a Beatles fan, Dr. Robert, or a Muppets fan, Dr. Bob. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I am a Muppets fan, but I'm not a fan of Dr. Bob. Really? Yeah, I like Dr. Rob better. I don't know why. Uh, it's the story of a surgeon. I can flex either way. Of a quack <laughs> who's gone to the dogs. <laughs> so, uh, in the news, what do you uh, what, what do you got there, Torn? You uh, you heard anything interesting? Any tidbits? I was reading recently that um, the Boy Scouts have uh, a merit badge for uh, nuclear science. Awesome! This Eight is, year old this splitting is, atoms. This is not this is the outstanding. this is not the Boy Scouts that I went to when I was a kid. No nuclear science. What do you think they do for that badge? What do you think you have to do to get that merit badge? They, they uh, make cloud chambers. Do you know how to make a really? cloud chamber, Rob? Uh, if I remember my grade 8 science class, I think I do, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Right. Wow, wow. He, he, that oh, was really no, so condescending. Kind of a, that was a good burn. <laughs> Dr. Rob <laughs> is a condescending prick sometimes. <laughs> no, really. We, <laughs> He's so knowledgeable. I wasn't meant to be. <laughs> wow. <laughs> really, you, That's okay. You can talk down to us. This is not a real science It's podcast. simple. You just take a fish tank, uh, put some dry ice in there, put, some, uh, put a cover on top of it, and then you get this nice cold condensate, then you, your radiate, radioactive sample is in there, and yeah. as it emits particles, they make uh, trails through the That's super right. cold... That's right, I do uh, kind of remember that. super oh, cold condensation. totally deserved to talk down to us on that and one. And that's how you can get your merit badge. But uh, they also will uh, just test different household uh, items with uh, Geiger counter. 
Oh, really? Yeah. What? Uh, what? And they may be not. What you, wait a sec. Now, hold on a sec. Now I want a Geiger yeah. counter. If there's things that are going to set this thing off in my household, oh yeah, everything. Should I know what they are? Tons of things will. Uh, is, is that not true? If you want radiophobia, we can talk about things in your house that will. Oh, oh no, I don't. Do. No, do I Let's don't. Do. I that, don't that, want to talk I about this. This is horrifying. That sounds oh, but like maybe, uh, maybe exactly our listeners. Our... I guess maybe our listeners want to know this information. They're gonna, they're gonna Common household this. items that emit uh, what are considered harmless levels of radiation include some TVs, computer monitors, smoke dis- de- 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 detectors, antique glassware, ceramics, even some foods. Antique glassware. Harmless levels. Harmless levels. Would that be the drink out of it? Rob? That would be the orange the... dye because uranium oh. used to. Uranium is a lovely reddish orange, and it makes uh, lovely. So if you if you see really bright orange bowls mm. that were made about a hundred years ago, there's a good chance that that's a uranium based dye. And red brick. <laughs> uh, so if you live in a red brick house, or if you have a brick foundation, then you're getting uh, lots of radon bathing you. Alpha wow. rays, beta rays, or gamma rays? Oh, good question. I'm not sure what the emissions of radon are. Oh, oh we we'll we'll failed. Sorry. Dr. Rob just <laughs> failed. <laughs> sure, you can make a cloud chamber. <laughs> you can't tell him when he comes out of radon. <laughs> All right, well, a- any... Uh... And you are radioactive, actually. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> You've got potassium-40 in you and carbon-12. Carbon-12. All right, okay, great. That's why they call great. me carbon-12, man. All right, so uh, sorry, I guess... Uh, carbon-14, not carbon. Carbon-12 is, is the regular ice. What would any, oh, what yeah, would any radioactivity uh, podcast be without a discussion of nuclear accidents? Chernobyl? Have to talk about Chernobyl, right? We'd be it's remiss. Not, it's yeah. not in the news, but... Uh, it was in the news yeah, at, at one some point. point. Yes, previously news is this section. Yeah, this is old. the previously this news. This is the old section. Yeah, the, the old news, news section. Old. Who knows about Chernobyl? I actually don't know much about it, except for uh, there are uh, certain parts of the forest that you still can't go into. Yeah, under the, like, three-headed babies are still being born. Three-headed babies? I'm pretty sure I saw it. Is that it apocryphal? On the, I think I saw it on, one of the, on the cover of one of those uh, newspapers that you get at the grocery store. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the bat boy yeah, on the cover as well. News. Yeah, absolutely. No, there, there, are, there was an incredibly high amount of birth defects in that region. I'm pretty sure that that's yeah. true. Maybe not three heads, but certainly one and a half. <laughs> Fair enough. I was, I was exaggerating. Uh, for so, Chernobyl was 1986. Effect. Anyway, 1986? yes, we were all alive when that happened. That's right. I remember it. It was, yeah. uh, that was the, the height of it was the big uh, news. It was the Cold War going on. We were all worried about Russia. One more reason and... to be happy not to be living in Russia. You don't have to deal with those troublesome Russian dolls, for one, one another significant reason. Absolutely. Or radiation Absolutely. assassins. Or, or yes, radiation, radiation assassins, assassins yes. as we've uh, lit Vinov. Uh, any other nuclear accidents that we know of? Uh, well, yeah, there's a, a large city in Brazil called Goiana, and there's a, the Goiana incident is actually the largest uh, nuclear incident in the Western Hemisphere. You don't hear much about it. Um, when, now, do you know when this happened up. approximately? I don't know the specific time frame when that happened. I believe it was in the, certainly within the last 20 years, maybe within the last 10. Sorry. So this was a hospital in uh, the city of Guyana that was basically abandoned, and salvagers came in to try and um, take the place apart, scrap metal and so forth. And unfortunately, the decommissioned radiotherapy machine was still in there, which uh, was no longer suitable for radiotherapy purposes, but still had plenty of radioactive cesium in its core, which the scrappers, being um, very efficient, cracked open to see if there's anything in there that was of value. So they seized the cesium? They cesium? Seized, indeed. Hardly knew them. <laughs> Sorry, okay. carry on. And they were fascinated to discover these glowing blue stones in the center <laughs> of this machine. Oh, that is fascinating. Yes, and so kryptonite. They, yeah. <laughs> they thought, kryptonite wow, green. we should well, show these to our kids. Kryptonite. And they brought them back home. Oh, and, no! Uh, kids were playing with them. Yikes. Uh, some people were putting them in their mouths. And uh, okay. they, they made I mean, the rounds. <laughs> sure, you know, they probably don't know what cesium is, but when you have a glowing blue stone, I, I don't think, and under any conditions, I would be... Uh, prompted to put it in my mouth. I'm not. I don't. I don't lick things at random. I guess that's your special saying. charm. Yeah, you're not a kid. When you were a kid, you probably put things in your mouth. Oh, I don't know. I didn't need dirt. Wow. You didn't need dirt. I didn't need dirt. It's like I, I don't even know you. I don't. <laughs> I don't put glowing blue rocks in my mouth. Uh, and ultimately, about a half dozen people died of acute radiation effects. There were about 200 people that needed to be treated. And speaking of radiophobia, about 100,000 people turned out for assessment because unfortunately some of the symptoms of uh, acute radiation sickness, nausea, vomiting, 
are very in similar. In as we discussed. <laughs> are very similar <laughs> to symptoms of anxiety. So um, so when people got worried about radiation poisoning. Oh, I'm feeling oh, nauseated. This could have happened to me. And ultimately, wow. uh, the blue stones went so far and ended up contaminating so much stuff that several cubic kilometers of uh, material had to be taken away and are now sitting in an old abandoned soccer stadium outside of the city. Oh. oh really sitting, sitting in the middle of the soccer field, glowing blue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for somebody to discover them. I'm just picturing this abandoned soccer stadium, the winds blowing through, and just right in the center field where you do the kickoff, there's a pile of glowing blue stones. Just waiting for the sequel. <laughs> just waiting, that's <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. And, they, and all of a sudden one of them cracks open and you hear a little... <laughs> as something hatches from inside. <laughs> so how does one treat uh, radiation poisoning? Typically, uh, treatment is, uh, is supportive. It depends on which kind of acute uh, phenomenon you get. Typically, Let's say I swallowed some blue balls. Look, there's, oh, let's say, we, let's some say glowing blue balls. <laughs> a glowing well, blue I may just roll them around in my mouth for a while. Yeah. Um, well, like mean, a tic-tac. The, the initial, the, the, the thing we talk about is called the LD5060. In other words, what's the lethal dose likely to kill 50% of people exposed within 60 days? without medical intervention. So it would really depend. We would want to see what level of uh, problem you had. So the first thing we would check would be your blood counts to see if your white cells were dropping. And that would be noticeable within about the first 48 or 72 hours. And it wouldn't peak until several weeks later. Um, and so if it seemed as though you had uh, received a lethal dose to your marrow, you might need an urgent marrow transplant, assuming mm-hmm, we could mm-hmm. find a suitable donor mm-hmm. in time. I think Marie so I can't just I can't just swallow some iodine pills or what? Well, uh, that's not going to do much for your marrow. It might help protect <laughs> your thyroid oh. uh, if what you swallowed contains uh, radio iodine, because uh, that's the big the big issue there. And that was one of the issues with Chernobyl. Is one of the gases that escaped was uh, radio iodine, which settled on fields where cows grazed, mm. who concentrated the radio iodine, and then this was milk, so children drank it. Yeah. Uh, and in milk. Poland, where they distributed iodine tablets, there were no cases of thyroid cancer. Wow. But in the countries where the unofficial disaster unofficially didn't happen, yes. uh, there was plenty of uh, thyroid cancer in the, the years that oh, followed, okay. unfortunately. And as we all know, thyroid cancer leads to three-headed babies. <laughs> we're separating fact from fiction here, gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> now, another, another nuclear action that I think we're all pretty familiar with is Three Mile Island. Something I learned about when we were researching the show, actually, is that uh, unlike, it seems, the Chernobyl incident, where, of course, they tried to hush it up and they didn't hand out the iodine to people uh, mm-hmm. so that there were a lot more casualties and a lot more damage done, Three Mile Island has estimated to have caused one death. Yeah, now there's a fantastic study in radiophobia. It was almost no actually uh, environmentally dangerous radiation released, but the, the, the panic uh, mm-hmm. was, uh, was palpable, which is one thing that would be interesting about you know, potentially a radiological terror incident. You wouldn't actually have to spread much radiation around. You'd have to just spread enough around for, for it to get detected by officials, and as soon as the word got out, it would be panic in the streets. Now, uh, uh, did Three Mile Island happen before or after Chernobyl? Uh, 79, I think. 79, so it was seven oh. years prior. Okay. I remember that too, though. I, I remember the everybody, we all watched the TV looking for updates to find out if there was a radioactive cloud heading towards our so side. Of the I was too busy in the country. barn yeah. drawing three headed babies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Torn had no patience for radioactivity to create three headed babies. He, <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't create three headed babies or monster movies, forget it. It's like it's dead to me. Yeah. <laughs> FDA committee recommends stricter tanning bed regulations. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah, previously these uh, these tanning beds were uh, class one. I think that this uh, regulation got brought in after seeing the Jersey Shore. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah, if those, uh, if I don't those even know. I have no idea what you're talking about. What's if the those, Jersey Shore? Those, <laughs> you don't know what Jersey Shore is? No. Oh, wow. If it's, those ladies uh, and gentlemen are genetic <laughs> mutations, I don't know what is. Jersey Shore is a reality TV show featuring a bunch of uh, New Jersey residents, young people who tan way too much oh, and okay. party and have really half a brain. And, and punch cancer. each other in the faces <laughs> and, repeatedly. Oh, that was, yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> despicable. Joe Rogan always said, uh, said in his uh, comedy, you know, we're only about three seasons away from The Running Man. <laughs> and it, it's true. Like the lowest common denominator is just getting lower and lower as we go. Well, you know, on that, on that, just as a quick aside, you know, I mean, remember going back and watching Brazil 
way back in the day, and yeah. all those little old ladies who had that crazy plastic surgery. I've had some complications with yeah, my complications. With my complications, <laughs> and we all laughed because it was so absurd and hysterical. <laughs> yeah. And now yeah. it's uh, far too close to true to uh, yeah <laughs> to so, be comfortable. March twenty fifth, Food and uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, the their general and plastic surgery devices panel. They have a panel that recommend that uh, up classifying tanning beds to class two with restrictions, or even possibly class three. After a day long meeting, and um, they were for twenty years, they were classified as class one medical devices, which means these cancer causing machines are subject to few regulations and little oversight. But of course, the uh, the a the International Agency for Research on Cancer (IARC), which is a working group of the World Health Organization (WHO) or WHO. Recently <laughs> added tanning beds to its Group One list, which identifies these devices as carcinogenic to humans. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, is anybody surprised by this? Is anybody surprised no. that tanning beds cause cancer? No. Okay, I'm so, not. No, yeah, not particularly. Uh, no. Next thing they're going to come up with a study saying sun mm. causes cancer. I think it's. Uh, they might. <laughs> they might classify the sun. As, as a class, class three class medical class three device. Right. Medical device. Yeah. <laughs> Necessary but dangerous. Any comments, Rob? Well, I guess this kind of gets back to how radiation actually damages the body. We could talk about that. If you okay. I would love to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, right, absolutely. Right. That's what we're all about. We're all about Especially how the- can horrible things damage your body the most. <laughs> uh, is there any point in time where your internal organs could be liquefied? Because that, to me, is the most horrifying thing. a tanning booth? I hope so. <laughs> that can never happen to a person. How, how high would the tanning booth have to be turned to liquefy your interior before your exterior? Wow, I'm not sure. Like a microwave. microwave. Like, <laughs> is it, can it become a human microwave? I don't know. I don't think so because oh, UV isn't Christmas. penetrative enough. I don't uh, even think microwaves do that, yeah. actually. Not exactly. Well, they do it to my hot pocket. Per se. <laughs> hot pocket. <laughs> well, they do it because, because your hot pockets, uh, the interior of your hot pocket is where the water is, and microwaves uh, stimu- stimulate the, uh, the water and make the water hot. Yeah, Kevin. But, but then it? again, you have water inside yeah, you. Yeah, I was so going to say, humans that, are 75% water guess, on the inside, yeah. too. You're lots of water, and this is why radiation is so dangerous to humans, because there are the direct effects of radiation. In, in other words, if a particle or a high-energy photon, say it goes slashing through a chromosome and can kind of break it apart. Oh, my but, chromosome! But really, what's far more <laughs> devastating is as radiation is slowing down and depositing its energy in you, it is doing this by knocking electrons out of their orbits in all kinds of water molecules primarily and creating potent, essentially oxidizing or sort of superoxides, we call them. And the superoxides are created by the thousands, say in the case of gamma or, or beta, or the tens or hundreds of thousands in the case of alpha. And those things quickly seek out anything with a sort of a net positive charge and uh, just tear it apart. In fact, you have uh, enzymes in you, superoxide dismutase, because this is a process that's happening all the time. Right. But when you get uh, tons of radiation, the, you, you overwhelm your capacity and you essentially tear apart your chromosomes or tear apart the, the integrity of the cells themselves leading to the, the acute effects. Wow. Like tear apart. Can you describe what you mean by tear apart? At a molecular level, you might say, say you've got this nice, pristine protein sitting there. It's a transporter, th- letting vital things in or out of a cell. Uh, this thing might get suffer so much oxidative damage, it can't function properly anymore. So now this is a cell that can't let stuff in or out, and that's a cell that's going to die. And right. now you multiply that by um, millions or billions of cells, and particularly, say, if they're neurons or, or, or marrow or cells in your body that have rapid turnover, like cells in your GI tract, then um, you're not long That's for this That's gastro, gastrointestinal, not yeah, general. Gastrointestinal, yeah. General sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. sorry, I went a little jargon there for a second. So, <laughs> so this, and, uh, another, this is also what causes cancer, so that you get a, this kind of damage that tears something apart, but instead of destroying it, it, it messes up its function? Right, so, and that's much harder to predict because we have, uh, because we're relatively long lived, we have DNA repair mechanisms that can actually repair oxidative damage because it takes so long for us to raise children who can then, you know, be independent. And one right. thing that's interesting is uh, uh, initially, because it's really easy to kill fruit flies with radiation, <laughs> it's really easy to kill mice, 
turns out that they just don't have nearly the capacity to repair genetic damage that we do. And so in some cases, it might be that we've overestimated or overstated the radiation risks in some cases. Oh, okay. Well, talking about genetic damage, uh, here's a little news item that uh, I read about, I remember reading about a couple of days ago. Somebody just broke the world record for most fingers and toes on a human being, on a single human being. Anybody, uh, li- how many fingers and toes is the new world record for most fingers and toes on a single human being? Well, so normally uh, the answer is 20. Normally the answer is 20. Okay, because we're, we're counting thumbs, I guess. So. Yep. I'm going to go with uh, 27. 27? I'm uh, going to say 300. 300. Three, 300. This is the millipede boy. Is this the price of right? The price of right style is closest without going over? Right. Right. That's right. Closest without going over. You're going I, way I, high. No, I'm not so going to say So Dr. Rob should say one then. Dr. Rob should go. One. Yeah, one. one. Well, no, I guess I'll go 11. 11. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It, uh, it, or 21. The, the, the answer, 21. Oh, my that's right, because his toes are included. The answer is 31. 31 figures and toes. And I don't know if that's... Uh, it didn't say whether or not it was radioactivity or, but it, it, this child is in China. This child is in China okay. in like a very industrialized part of the well, country. Well, here's a scientific so question that maybe radioactivity is involved. Here's a scientific question that maybe Dr. Rob can answer. Mutation and radiation. What's yeah. the connection? The basic idea is that um, if, say, uh, radiation damages your germ cells, so sperm in a male, eggs in a female then the child that results from the um, meeting of those would potentially have um, mutations. Now, there have been some studies. There's a long-term study that's being done in Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, and it turns out that the, even the base rates of mutation are much, much lower than we thought because typically, if there's going to be a mutation, it's going to be lethal to the uh, fetus, and it just won't survive to term. So the kids that do survive actually tend to be fine. No, no reported higher incidence of, uh, of cancer. Wow. So, Dr. Rob, I, this, uh, I think uh, this is a question that all of our listeners are going to want to know the answer to. D- do you know of uh, at any point in time where a, a genetic mutation caused by radiation has actually turned out to be a good thing? I'm kind of hoping he's going to come up with a Superman story right now. Eye beams. Well, this... Eye beams. Laser beams from your eyes. Anything like that. Let me put it this way. Is anything on the gamma world list of mutations (laughs) even remotely (laughs) possible? Uh, The only thing I I, I know about is is a phenomenon called radiation hormesis, which is the idea, the theory or hypothesis that low levels of radiation may actually be a health benefit because in certain animal models uh, we know that low levels of exposure to radiation seem to cause a boost boost to the immune system and aid the animal's ability to recover from wounds or infections. Now it's mm-hmm. not clear if that happens in humans because uh, you know we don't sp- want to despite, our, but despite our best efforts we can't get parents to volunteer their two-year-olds right. for the research. I'll do uh, it. So that <laughs> I, I, you'll volunteer your two-year-old? Right. Uh, I'll make one. Okay. <laughs> Let's get started on that right away. Well, that, could, could that be that uh, as you're saying humans tend to have we've got the repair mechanisms so we can handle it but the, all these other organisms especially the ones that that might get into our wounds and and cause infections do not so they get zapped and and uh, we recover hard to say because yeah. uh, it, it's it's never been demonstrated in humans but no one's gone looking for it in humans either. okay uh, it'd be a little hard to run that yeah. experiment yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> in your so as far as you know as of yet there uh, hasn't yet been a positive effect from radiation mutation that uh, well, how about how about it, uh, evolutionary wise? I mean, I know that it's generally uh, like say an evolutionary step is a is a minor change in the in the way that a that an organism's uh, genes are created and, and can create some kind of new ability or changes of the color or something like that. Can any of that happen because of is cosmic it, is rays? It some kind of radioactive. You could certainly event. hypothesize that our repair mechanisms themselves are the product of long term low level radiation yeah. exposure. Mice don't need to live long. Fruit flies don't need to live long. We right. do need to live long because yeah. we're huge and complicated. Right. So this could be a product Some of than others. sort of constant bathing in low-level radiation. <laughs> so were I to have a pregnant girlfriend, you would not recommend that I make her drink out of antique glass on a daily basis? Well, orange uh, in, in the hopes of getting Wolverine out of the pot. I certainly wouldn't want to <laughs> pulverize old orange uh, cooking ware or uh, fruit bowls and make her drink those. <laughs> <laughs> or, or use a revigator. <laughs> uh, Bill Gates and has some ideas uh, 
for a nuclear power plant. Oh, right. So, yeah, getting out of the, uh, getting a little off outside of my wheelhouse, but, uh, yeah, the Gates Foundation is looking at research to develop nuclear reactors that can use nuclear waste, potentially, even if we run out of that, and we have enough to last something like 100,000 years. But if we do run out of that, then you could dredge up uh, low-level uh, uranium out of seawater and uh, power the planet pretty much until the sun goes nova. Ooh, wow. You, Bill Gates using coming through. nuclear waste as fuel in your new nuclear reactor. That oh. sounds promising. Fallout 3, excellent video game. Fantastic video game. On the, on the topic of pop culture. Oh, we haven't even gotten into the pop culture section. We have not. Yet. We can have a, a brief uh, pop culture section. Who's played uh, Fallout 3? I have played Fallout 3 and all the expansion packs. I've played all of them except for one, so you win on that one. I do. My favorite uh, radioactive waste moment in movie history was uh, in RoboCop, the first one when uh, that guy gets bathed in that uh, oh, yeah. uh, yes, yeah, that radioactive waste and he becomes uh, like a like like a fresh watermelon that he just his entire across yeah, the head yeah. of yeah. Then he explodes, doesn't he? He, he explodes yeah, he, when the he car gets, hits him. Yeah, the car hits him. Yeah, he just like turns an overripe to, watermelon. Turns to goo, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about Squadron Supreme. Who remembers that miniseries I, from Marvel? I no. do not. You don't remember Squadron Supreme? I know. Squadron Supreme, <laughs> written in the 80s. Please tell me about it. Okay, Squadron Supreme is basically Marvel's version of the Justice League. Okay. Okay. They have oh, uh, that's Doctor Hyperion? Spectrum. Hyperion? Yeah, Hyperion is yeah, Superman. Okay. Doctor Spectrum is Green Lantern, and they had this one character called Nuke. Okay. And he was radioactive. Okay. That's, that was his powers. All right. And his parents died because they died of radiation poisoning, and he eventually went mad, and, and Dr. Spectrum had to kill him and stuff like that. You, I can't believe you haven't read this. No, no I do not remember Squadron Supreme. Sorry. Okay, well, you should look okay, into it, because it's actually a pretty good comic. My favorite uh, radioactivity yeah, it's, it's moment? A, it's an unabashed rip-off comic, and maybe that's why I avoided it all this time, but... Uh, it's, it was a 12-issue limited series, and I'm sure you can get a graphic novel for him now. Okay, all right. So my, I, my favorite radioactivity moment in pop culture has to be the little mini movie at the beginning of Bob and Doug's Strange Brew. Oh, oh. <laughs> she you to stop, or you friend, or enemy. Psst, act, act. <laughs> Take off, eh? Radiation has made me an enemy to civilization. Yeah, that's very nice. Very nice. nice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. That's Rob. Wonderful. We'll get you a caustic soda t-shirt. You can wear proudly around your lab. Can't wait. It'll be lots of fun. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us here on Caustic Soda, the podcast. And uh, see you next time. We'll see you next week. Uh, do we know what our topic next week is going to be yet? Black holes. Black holes. Black ah, holes. Yes. Holes in space. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Good night. <laughs>